Deputy Director of Nitschitz Silver Engineering Department and all Nitschitz Board of Directors. She is a graduate of UMass Amherst with a bachelor's degree in silver and environmental engineering and a professional engineer. In her free time, Deb likes to spend time outside with her husband and friends, hiking, snowboarding, and walking her dog, Porchop. Um, so I'm gonna be introducing the next person. Her name is Chanel, Chanel Jackson, and she also attends uh, Niches Engineering. So Chanel Jackson is a silver project engineer working at Niches Engineering. She enjoys um, integrating civil civil engineering knowledge to help the uh, to by rating um, environment and increasing, you know, increase the quality of life for all people. She has a uh, particular interest in storm water management practices and appreciates how green and uh, in a infrastructure can be used to mimic the natural environment in her spare time. Chanel is an, is an avid reader and runs a books blog. She also enjoys guarding and spending time with friends and family. Get no clap. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Therajean. And uh, Deb and Chanel, feel free to take it away. Okay, well, I will just share my screen to get this started. You think I would know how to do this by now. Let's see. Oh, here we go. You're doing great, you got it. Let's see, share. Okay, present from the beginning. Okay, thank you for having me everyone. I am a civil engineer and I am so happy to talk to you all about what civil engineers do day to day and what the job looks like and what engineering in general looks like. So I put together this presentation that is titled, what do civil engineers do in the real world anyway? My name is Chanel Jackson. I am a licensed professional engineer and I work for Niche Engineering. So we'll start with a little bit about me, um, just so you know where I am coming from, where I'm going. So I went to school on the West Coast. I'm from the West Coast. I studied at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which is just a school on the Central Coast. It's really beautiful. So I included a picture in case anyone's interested in going there one day. I thought this would be a good incentive for you. Um, I got my bachelor's of science in civil engineering for four years, and then I moved up to Seattle. And in Seattle, I worked for another civil engineering company and worked on some really awesome projects all around Washington. Um, one in particular that I included here is Amazon. So I worked on a couple of projects for Amazon, and this one is quite an attraction. It's these three huge orbs that was very different than anything I'd ever worked on. So. It was just fun to be a part of, so I included it here um, as part of my work in Seattle. And then after Seattle, I moved to Boston a couple of years ago, where I work today. I work for Niche Engineering, which has been a fantastic company. Um, it's woman-owned, and it's about like 110 people total. It was named one of the best places or top places to work by the Boston Globe, and I can attest, it's pretty great. Okay, so to make this a bit more interactive, I don't think all of you have access to computers, but maybe I can see you from the from the webcam. Um, I just wanted to get a feel for how much exposure you've had to engineering. So if you can either use your tools on the Zoom to raise your hand or just raise your hand in person, I would like to know um, if you know an engineer personally, raise your hand. Okay. Great, perfect. Um, what about a civil engineer personally? Great, a little, little less, makes sense. Okay, um, this one may be difficult, but we're gonna do it anyway. I just wanted to know if you had any examples of engineers that come to mind, be it in movies, in books, in the news. You can add it to the chat, you can say it in person and it can get passed on. Um, what comes to mind? Few that I was thinking about, oops, um, Iron Man, it's a classic. Um, let's see, Gustav Eiffel, structural engineer, prison break, you've seen prison break. So if you think of them, 
can add them to the chat and we can talk later. Okay. So big picture, what is an engineer? It's a pretty catch all term. So we broke it down into a few major pieces of just what an engineer is. Engineers apply the principles of science and math to develop economical solutions to technical problems. So much more technical than it is theoretical. We um, are problem solving and we're finding efficient solutions to things. And there's a bunch of different types of engineering. Of engineering. So a list here, we have biomedical, also known as BMED, chemical, civil and environmental, which is what I do, industrial engineering, mechanical, electrical, mining and petroleum, systems, forensics. It is a broad, it's a broad field. But in general, what does an engineer do? So in general, my day to day, we're solving problems. We have practical solutions. We have um, a problem of how to capture your stormwater and get it away from the buildings. We have how to make a building stand. So we're coming up with solutions for those big problems. We fix things pretty general as well, but uh, we are looking to fix things efficiently and less expensively, especially if you're working for a city or a school with a tight budget. You want to make sure everything's working properly, but you don't want to break the bank. Lots of communication, constantly talking to problem teams or project teams, whether it's internal or external, and a lot of client management. So when you are working on a project, you have architects, you have landscape architects, you have mechanical engineers, you have a lot of people at the table. So learning how to communicate and speak their language and communicate what you're thinking and what you're designing is really important. And then big picture thinking, um, understanding exactly what the project is for, what the scope of the project is, and being able to juggle things like a schedule, a budget, all of that stuff, and construction impacts. So with civil engineering, it's pretty broad. There, it's a big umbrella with a lot of things underneath it. So we have civil, site and civil, which is more of a land development. Um, this is what I do, so we'll be talking more about that in these slides. We have traffic and transportation, structural, bridges, and buildings. We have geotechnical, lots to do with soils, um, construction and construction management, and then environmental, which has hazardous site remediation, wastewater design, water treatment design. Um, so those all technically fall under civil engineering, but you start to specialize, especially when you're in school. But when you go into, when you're finding a job, you are usually working for one of these. My company, Niche Engineering, has a few of these within the company. So we do land development, we have a transportation department, we have a structural department, and um, we all work together on projects, but we're not all doing all of those different things. So you start, you start to specialize. Oh, and or you can work for the state or the town as an employee. So things that are civil engineering projects that you are very familiar with, highways, roadways, bridges, large environmental projects, developmental building projects. And just, there's just a few of these that um, you might not be realizing in civil engineering, but civil engineering has its hands all over these big types of projects. The Hoover Dam is here. Um, yeah, so lots, lots of different stuff for civil engineering. Okay, so if I were you, and when I was in your position, I just really wanted to know what a young civil engineer did, what the day-to-day -day was, and I tried to break it out here, but it's it's a bit difficult because jobs vary, and depending on what direction you want to go, it'll look different. Um, so it depends on where you work. If you're in a private company, a municipal, if you're in the field and you're working for a survey crew, those days look different. Um, depends on your projects. So I work on I work on a bunch of smaller projects and a couple of big projects. So I'm, I have maybe eight active projects, but some people work on one really big project and that's their day. And, but we mostly all use the same software. So to design improvements, we are using AutoCAD, Civil 3D, Revit, SSA, HydroCAD, the works, lots of different software to use. Um, and then probably the biggest is that you are coordinating through emails and meetings a lot of emails, mostly emails, um, more meetings these days, but it takes a lot of coordination between internal office, external office. So just learning how to write a good email and, and speak your mind um, and listen is really important. And then we do some public presentations to the town. When the town wants to know what's going on with projects, you have to present um, or work with a team to present and writing letters and reports. And then a fun one is, would be the construction site visits. You actually get to go on site and see your project get built or see your stormwater get put into the ground. And 
that can be fine. It goes from paper to the real world. And there's a lot that's missed when you're just working in on the computer. So seeing it in person is really impactful. Okay, so this deserves a slide of its own, AutoCAD. I don't know if, if you've all had exposure to this, but we work in AutoCAD all the time. Um, there's, a, there's a good learning curve to it, but it's enjoyable at this point. So when we are designing a project, we're creating a plan set and the plan set gets created in AutoCAD. So you can see, this is just a screenshot of my computer of a project I was working on. And it's a building down in Brighton, Massachusetts. It's actually a condo building. Um, and this is just what it looks like to draft in AutoCAD. And any familiarity you can get with AutoCAD, if this is the direction you want to go, I, I highly recommend. So other things civil engineers do, we do a good bit of professional development. There's a lot of opportunity to continue your education through seminars and trainings. You can meet awesome people. I've met a few friends um, through professional societies. Maybe they're landscape architects. Maybe they're a different type of fields that joining those happy hours and um, doing tours of projects. It's, there's a lot of opportunity for that. And then I just encourage to have a balanced life. I think what I've learned most at, well, one of the big things I've learned in engineering is that the people there are pretty well balanced. People have hobbies and passions and it's important to maintain those so you have a good work-life balance with the, the demand of being a civil engineer. Okay, so Transitioning more into the weeds of civil engineering, part of my day today has to deal with stormwater um, and green infrastructure. So stormwater is the amount, like it's the rainfall that falls on the site, the actual, like the actual liquid, the rain that's on the ground and you're trying to figure out what to do with it. And green infrastructure is something we put into place to be able to handle that stormwater. So I put a blurb here about what green infrastructure is. It basically mimics the natural approach of, um, let's say a field used to be grass and water used to hit it and it would infiltrate into the grass. But now we turned it into a concrete patio. So that rainwater hits it and slides right on off. Um, so what we do is we try to implement more of a natural hydrology um, design by using these, these options. So we have rain gardens, fire retention storm, stormwater gardens, um, permeable pavement's a big one. So we utilize this to help manage stormwater so we're not flooding all of our city systems downstream because if it shoots off the concrete and goes into the storm system, then it could impact the storm system. So essentially we're trying to mimic nature as best as we can while still developing. And where you might have seen these in action, so the New York City High Line implemented a few different um, best management practices, BMPs, and I, so I included this here. You can't totally see them and pick them out, but the biggest one is increasing the amount of pervious surface. So in the existing condition, this was a rail line and, uh, or a train track and concrete, steel, so no greenery. Um, but in the developed condition, they put in a bunch of greenery, a bunch of places for rainwater to be sent to and infiltrate into the, into the soil and, there are a couple water retention basins along here, which is a fancy word for like a bathtub with a bunch of soil that traps water into it. Um, so this one you may be familiar with. And then this is another just good overview of what it means to create a green street. So in the existing condition of this, this is so over here, we have mm, concrete jungle. We have a lot of asphalt. We have concrete sidewalks, really no greenery to be seen. So um, now this is Ashmont Station, correct? Yes. My my um, locator is not showing up on this. I'm pretty sure this is Ashmont Station. Yeah, I believe that's Ashmont Station. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Deb. Okay. Perfect. Um, yes. So so you may have seen this yourself. So in the in the proposed condition, we have put in a bunch of different ways to start mimicking that natural hydrology to start capturing that rainwater and infiltrating it instead of it running into the city system. So. In the, in the proposed condition, the alternative that was selected, you can see there's, there, there's grass, there's vegetation, we have permeable pavers, which is essentially um, a surface pavement that can infiltrate water through it because there's a base of soil or section below that can handle that water. Um, there's some bioretention planters. So when we say green streets, we really just mean like upping the amount of vegetation, upping the amount of stormwater green infrastructure that, that's included. Okay, so this is another, uh, I thought this is fascinating. So this is a project I'm working on at Princeton University. It's called East Campus. 
Um, it's a pretty big site, a bunch of different pieces to it, but this field here is a soccer field and this enlarged version is the same soccer field, but with a cut through it. So it's like a section. And this is what that section looks like. So beneath the soccer field is a huge detention system. These big chambers that handle all the stormwater that's coming from upstream where you can't see it. It's routing underneath here and these chambers hold onto it and slowly release it. So you're not impacting the big river down here. So it's not scouring, it's not um, overflowing the system. It's just slowly releasing. And, and we use this to, again, mimic the natural hydrology and to um, not overrun the existing systems that are in place. But it always surprised me. I never knew things like this existed under just your average soccer field. Okay, this, this one's one of my favorites. This was when I was working in Seattle. I was working on a high school that was in the FEMA flood zone where uh, I think it was six feet below the FEMA flood zone. So to rebuild the high school, they had to build up above that FEMA flood zone because you can't have any occupiable space within, um, within the flood zone itself. So the high school said, how do we build everything six feet up when the roads on either side, here's a road here, and a road over here. Um, how do we build everything up six feet? We had to do it. So the school ended up being built up on a platform. And then I included this. So these are the fields. I, I don't know if you can see, this is a baseball field, another baseball field. Um, it was raised six feet and these huge pipes below were installed that look like this on the ends. They just run the length of the field and it allows stormwater that may come flooding down this street to just pass right on through underneath the fields and not, um, not overrun the fields themselves and to be able to build up, but also keep the stormwater off the site, which was, it was a big effort, but um, civil engineering at work. Okay, so this is another project, again in Seattle, I included it mostly because this is from Google Earth and I wanted you to see a project that was built that has a bunch of different um, green infrastructure in place already. So this is a project that has a vegetated roof, which is a green roof, important because it will capture water and infiltrate it in a way that it would just slide off of concrete. Um, we have some bioretention basins here. We have increased greenscape. They put a bunch of trees in. There is a perforation, perforated pipe infiltration system here. Just one of the practices you can put into place. Um, but all of these together, we're able to limit the amount of stormwater that was running off the site. So it's it's more often than not that we're using multiple um, green infrastructure practices to be able to design for a site. And then I included this too, because a lot of our work on top of green infrastructure is in the right of way, is, is creating protected bike lanes for pedestrians and ADA ramps. So transitioning to that bit of civil engineering. Um, so that you may be familiar with this, this is on Vassar Street in Cambridge really any protected bike lane a civil engineer likely touched and helped create the elevations that make it work. Um, so this is a lot of fun. This is immediate payoff too because you're able to design to, cre to keep cyclists safe and pedestrians safe. And um, I find a lot of, of joy in just doing that because I don't know if you've biked around before, but biking on big streets is terrifying. So if you can have an actual protected bike lane to keep yourself out of the flow of traffic all for it. Um, this is another project I worked on where the bike lane was, you can kind of see it's, it's doing funky things, but it goes up and it's separate from the from the roadway here. And then you have a, a pedestrian path right next to it. So we also sit in meetings to help develop that design, to help push that those ideas forward. And again, some ADA ramps here that are designed to meet ADA code. Okay, so this one I understand is very close to your school. It's very fascinating. So Moakley Park, when we were designing Moakley Park improvements, um, there was a big study on sea level rise. So by the year 2020, 36 inches of sea level rise is expected um, during a one inch storm event. So anything you see in blue will be touched by that impact, uh, which it covers quite a bit. I mean, this blue, so stormwater and from the sea will rise and come all the way up to these edges past Moakley Park. Um, so in designing for any kind of improvement down here, it was really important that we take into account what's, what's coming down the pipeline in our future. Um, and one thing to point out here is that you can see like this is higher in elevation, so it's not, it's not as impacted. And then over here, this UMass area is completely removed from the blue and it's 
because during their proposed talks and when they are developing this project, they kept that in mind and they were able to build up and out of the impacted zone. So to show you, yeah. Sounded like you said 2020, but this happens in 27. Oh, so did I? Years. 27. So no one okay. worry that we're going to get flooded tomorrow. Great. Nobody wants to go back to 2020, 2070. Yes, exactly. Okay, so in the proposed improvements for Milkley Park, this is just a rendering of what it's going to look like after all the construction is done. So to be able to deal with that stormwater that's coming up, you almost had to create a wall, which is what this project did. They created this berm, which is, it starts, well, you can kind of see, so the edge of the soccer field, it's basically a sledding hill up to the top where the trees are, it's a ridge, and it's, it's acting like a seawall that will keep all of this stormwater the storm warner may come all the way up to it, but it, it won't go over um, and it will go back down. So the site itself put a lot of effort into designing for that 2070 storm event. Um, and then as well, all, all below these fields. So similar to Princeton East Campus with those big chambers below the soccer field, those are things like that are also below these fields that capture the storm water, slow it down and then release it to the city. So you're not going to have the same kind of flooding you would if just a 2070 storm event were to hit this site without any improvements. So, um, and Deb worked, oh, Deb worked on this project too and, and was able to help implement those designs and make sure that this is going to be okay if the 1% hits in 2070 and it really is 36 inches of sea level rise. So, um, and I think your school is somewhere around here too over in this area. So I'm sure you've, you're, you've seen Moakley Park and been there and and you'll be able to see this in action one day. So hopefully I piqued your interest a little bit and you may be asking, what can you do now to prepare for a job like this? And my biggest recommendation is a summer job or an internship. It's a pretty low stakes, like three month commitment where you really get to see if you like it. If you, if you can see yourself in this kind of job, if you like the company, um, I couldn't really recommend that more in terms of just getting immersed in the field itself. Um, on top of that, I would recommend CAD courses if you can do any kind of Autodesk or AutoCAD and writing courses, presentation courses. You could be here one day or you could be presenting to a city and trying to convince them that your project works. Um, management courses. And one of my favorite tidbits to share is just to stay well-rounded because it's important to have well-rounded people in a room discussing things. So keep your passions, invest in your hobbies, and it will also help you with your work-life balance when you become a full-time employee and you're working really hard. And um, yeah, that's one that I couldn't, I also couldn't recommend enough. And then just meet and talk to engineers, see what their life is like, see if you like them, see if you like what their life looks like, and uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. So with that, if you have any questions, I would love to hear them. Feel free to email me too. I left my email here in case you have a question that comes to you later. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you very much. Can we uh, please get uh, Ms. Jackson a round of applause, please? Thank you very much. So um, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, you know, raise your hand. Mr. Dickens can call on you. Or if you're at a computer uh, for my juniors, feel free to type them in and uh, we can fill them. Yep. Oh, don't know. I think he's uh, just getting them together to ask questions. On okay. Question. Go ahead, Javi. Uh, is it harder to be a female engineer or a male engineer? Is it harder to be a female engineer or a male engineer? A female engineer or a male engineer? Yes. 
It's a good question. I think there are different barriers and unique barriers to being a female engineer, just in terms of encouragement or what's expected of your capabilities. But you, um, I never found it to stop me in any regard. I can't necessarily speak to the male experience, but as a, the female experience in my college, um, that's something we talked about a lot because it is a little bit different. It's, I think my class in college was about 20% female. And then that's pretty accurate uh, in the workplace too, 30 to 40%. But it's not necessarily harder. I think you just have to have confidence and advocate for yourself. Awesome. Thank you very much, Chanel. We have a follow up question, Javi. Uh, did she want to be an engineer when she was like young? Like that was in that or like you did, did you want to be an engineer when you were young? No, I did not. I wanted to be a marine biologist or what have you, a librarian. I wanted to be a lot of different things. Um, I don't think it was until I was in high school that I really liked math and physics and I still had no idea what I wanted to do because I also liked English and history um, that I had an uncle encourage me towards engineering and, and I looked into it and that's that's kind of the direction I, well, that is the direction that I chose from there. But did not want to be an engineer when I grew up. Didn't know what an engineer was, to be honest with you. I didn't have any exposure to that. Awesome. And as uh, Ms. Jackson spoke about internships, so we actually have uh, one of the individuals that's in your school right now, uh, based on his interaction with one of our um, partners, is actually going to be doing an internship the year after he graduates and before he starts at Wentworth. So there are opportunities, real life opportunities, uh, for Dearborn students to do internships. Uh, right now we're looking at post high school, but in the next couple of years, we're looking to develop a pipeline where even during your high school years, you're having an opportunity. So particularly for the juniors that are interested, uh, hopefully you took down Ms. Jackson's email address and uh, Mr. Dixon and uh, Ms. Armquist can most certainly share mine, but uh, you know we're here to provide you not only just with information, but also some opportunities for you to get some experience in the career to see if it's something that you enjoy um, and if possible, get you some uh, time out on site and or in the office to see if that is in fact what you would like to study in college and do uh, thereafter. Awesome. Uh, Mr. Dixon, do we have any more questions from the class or any of my juniors um, that came over? Again, I appreciate you coming over from your other class. If you have any questions uh, for Ms. Jackson or Ms. Danik. What does a typical workday look like for you? For me, right now, it's a little different. I'm actually <laughs> watching the sunrise in California because <laughs> I am um, I am visiting family for the first time in a year and a half and working from home. So this past year has looked like a lot of working from home, but normally it is working maybe an eight or nine hour day. Um, working on a handful of projects, probably juggling four to five projects per day, which takes some getting used to because there's a lot of mental space that you need to like be able to focus and, and tr transition efficiently. Um, I work on I work on some Boston projects, so that means some of my day is permitting related, where it's a bit more technical and checking boxes and things like that. But then I work on some fun stormwater projects where the other day I was just I had a blank slate, it was a high school and I was just laying out stormwater management. So I got to decide what kind of system we should put into place. So um, the days tend to vary between design and report writing. Um, and more recently, more delegating as I'm getting more experience, I'm working with younger engineers more. So there's a bit more of, of that kind of management going on. That's a typical day. Yeah, I think we're set here. All right, super. Well, listen, if we can just please, uh, uh, Mr. Dixon, are you going to have uh, Mr. Therajean wrap us up again? Okay, no, I didn't know we were going to hear from him. Okay, um, no, we have Paula. Paula's going to go ahead. And oh, Paula's going to do it. Nice. Thank you, Paula.
All right, here we go. So I have Quiet, Beauty. Beauty. Huh? You're on. Beauty, speak loudly. Go ahead, Paula. Um, I really appreciate having um, a woman engineer sharing about um, the, their experience. And I, uh, I think that I learned from her that I really didn't know about is um, type of engineers like uh, um, electrical, by, by, by biodemedical and systems. Um, and thanks so much for coming to visit um, BSA. Please, please feel free to, um, to come again and soon. Thank you so much for having me. It was a joy to talk to you all. And thanks for the great questions too. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Chanel. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Kristen. Mr. Dixon, I appreciate you. Thank you very much to all the juniors. And um, yeah, we're still figuring out our date for next month and uh, look forward to seeing you all again. And for those of you that are watching this on the video recording, um, you know, good viewing and uh, feel free to tap in if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.